Hey guys, what's up? I want to share a new study with you that just came out a few days ago. The study is about pro-social behavior and the emulation of masculine roles or masculine norms in adolescent boys. Now this is a topic that I'm very interested in and I think it's one that you will see reoccurring on this channel or if you have read anything that I have written, reoccurring in the themes of things that I write and that has to do with pro-social versus anti-social behavior. Because what a lot of the manosphere gets wrong about pro-social and anti-social behavior is that it is pro-social behavior primarily associated with a higher status, a higher position in the social dominance hierarchy. This is true both for human beings in the modern era, as well as human beings, say, 2,000 years ago, and as well as hunter-gatherers or human prehistory. So rather than focusing on and glorifying antisocial behavior, what people should really be focusing on if they want to improve their own dominance and their own success in life, particularly with relationships, but also with everything else, is essentially pro-social behavior, cultivating being what is essentially a productive member of society who contributes, who provides for those around him, his in-group, his wife, his girlfriend, and so on. Here's a study on that or I should say a study kind of related to that, that I think a lot of you will find interesting anyway. The title of this study is Too Hunky to Help, A Person-Centered Approach to Masculinity and Pro-Social Behavior Beliefs Among Adolescent Boys. Just a quick overview of this study. We're looking at a sample size of 260 young boys. The age between 11 and 13, so a pretty small age range. We're looking at essentially early pubescent and prepubescent adolescent boys. This is a convenient sample from schools in the southwest of the United States. Let's have a look at some of the conclusions and the findings of this study first, and then we can go over specifically what those things mean and how they may apply both to the development of masculinity in adolescent boys and also perhaps to your own lives out there as well. So the first important finding in this study is that masculine norm adherence. We're going to say masculine norm adherence. And we're going to come back to what that means. We're going to look at the measures specifically. But this predicts lower prosocial behavior in boys. So typically not a good thing. And the correlation here is a 0.34. So we're looking at what is essentially a medium-sized negative correlation in psychology. The second main finding here is that prosocial behavior predicts social competence in adolescent boys. And again, we see a medium correlation here at 0.43, a positive correlation. And finally, 50% of the boys in this study, they fell into a category dubbed socially precarious. And this is boys that have low social competence, but that have a lot of pressure to emulate masculine roles. So I said masculine norm adherence, and this is going to be the first measure in this study. And anytime we look at research on dating, on anything in psychology, if you read the abstract, if you just read the title, you might see something like that and it might mean something or sound like something to you that is very, very different from what it actually measures. So the important thing anytime you read psychological research is that you look at the specific psychometrics used and you see what exactly they're measuring. What are the questions being asked? What are those items? So let's look at that right now. When the researchers say masculine norm adherence, masculine norms, masculine norm roles, what exactly are they referring to? Well, in the case of this study, it looks like what we're referring to specifically is the adolescent masculinity ideology and relationships scale. And this is a series of 12 questions that they adapted for adolescent boys. Let's go through these now, and then you can have an idea of what specifically is being measured. Some of these items, perhaps you will think they are bad things. Some, maybe you think they will think they are good things or that they are dependent on the context where well, you can have an opinion and let's see what they are. So the first question here, it says, it's important for a guy to act like nothing is wrong, even when something is bothering him. So there's a couple of ways that we can look at a question like this. To some extent, there probably is a social benefit, especially for a young man, a young boy, in hiding problems and his feelings. Perhaps he won't be bullied as much for that expression. At the same time, there is a very clear trade-off here, and that has to do with mental health, is that men suppress their feelings and expression of those feelings, and it plays out down the line 
in poor mental health outcomes. So is this even a masculine role, hiding your feelings? To some extent it is, but these are the kind of questions that we're looking at. Item number two. In a good dating relationship, the guy gets his way most of the time. This probably comes down to how you interpret it, if you believe that the man should dominate the relationship and be a leader in the relationship, or if it comes across as something to you, uh, perhaps controlling or negative. Item number three. Now some of these questions, before I read item number three here, some of these questions are reverse scored, which means normally if a person scores high on the question, it means they score high in that masculine norm inherence. This is the opposite way around. It's reverse scored, a lower score. So we're looking at the opposite of what it says. So the question says, I can respect a guy who backs down from a fight. So really it's saying, I can't respect someone who backs down from a fight. And what we're talking about here, particularly in boys 11 to 13 years old, is you know, adolescent aggression, fights on the playground, typically antisocial behavior. And that's something we'll see with some of these questions. It's intuitive that they predict antisocial behavior because they're basically asking or defining a specific antisocial behavior like getting in fist fights with other boys. Question number four. It's okay for a guy to say no to sex. Reverse scored, so what they're saying again. It's not okay for a guy to say no to sex. So, of course, this is a male stereotype that men always want sex and should always be ready for sex. And this leads to many problems, including men getting in their head and not being able to get erections during sex and that sort of thing. They get performance anxiety because of this, this social stereotype and pressure. So is that something that you think is a good masculine norm for boys to emulate? Especially even to worry about at 11 to 13 years old? I don't know. I mean, you guys tell me. Leave a comment and let me know what you think about that. Item number five, guys should not let it show when their feelings are hurt. Okay, very similar to the first question. Again, it's a question about hiding your feelings. Should men express their feelings or not? Question number six here, a guy never needs to hit another guy to get respect. Okay, so again, we're talking about a guy has to hit other people to get respect, great. Uh, do you think that's the case? This is obviously a masculine norm, but is it a positive norm? Is it good masculinity or what someone might say, toxic masculinity, where you have to get into physical fights to prove your masculinity. And I'll tell you what, guys, I'll tell you what I think about this. I boxed for 10 years, and getting into fights on the street is not going to make you more masculine. In fact, that's really a sign of people very low in the social dominance hierarchy. If you're getting into fist fights and scrabbling with other people, you know, those kind of people, where you find them, you find them in jail is where you find them. You find them at the very, very bottom the least dominant men in society. So, I digress. Let's look at the rest of the questions here. Seven, if a guy tells his worries, he will look weak. Again, another question about sharing feelings. Should a guy express his worries? Well, perhaps he will look weak. There might actually be something to that. At the same time, if you don't express your worries, will people act on them? Will people be able to change their behavior in accordance with those worries? Will you get what you want if you don't express yourself and what upsets you? Probably not. So we see kind of a trade-off there between some practicality with remaining a stoic man in a traditional sense, in a stereotypical sense, and with actually expressing saying, hey, I don't feel okay, or this is not okay with me, and it needs to be done differently, or whatever the case may be. Moving on to the next question. Says, I think it's important for a guy to go after what he wants, even if it means hurting other people's feelings. So there's actually a lot to unpack with this kind of question. And this depends on how comfortable you are trying to strive to get what you want at the expense of other people. And there's probably a lot of context with that insofar as are you just hurting someone else, their feelings in a superficial way, is it something serious, whatever. There's a lot to unpack with that question and it probably is less specific than some of the others in what its implications really are. Moving on to question number nine. I think it's important for a guy to act like he is sexually active even when he is not. And I mean, this is something that you will see in the manosphere, in red pill spaces, in the PUA, pickup artist type spaces. They will tell men who are not very successful sexually to pretend like they are. They will tell them, ah, spin plates or date multiple people. Women will see you with one woman and they'll think you're more attractive because of pre-selection, that sort of thing. 
And the fact of the matter is, most of these men are just not very successful with women. They're not spinning plates. They don't have a bunch of different girlfriends. But that image is important for them, for their dating strategy. Not even necessarily because it actually helps them get more women as individuals, but because it helps them sell that image to the people buying their programs. But that's what we're looking at here. And ultimately, with that kind of question, what we're looking at as well is a behavior that is fundamentally dishonest. So you're going to say that you're having sex with a lot of women when you're not? Okay, it's a lie. What more can be said about that? It's, it's an image that's cultivated that is dishonest and untruthful. Let's just look at the next question. It says, I would be friends with a guy who is gay. This is reverse scored, so of course it's saying, I would not be friends with a guy who is gay. Now, this is basically just a, a single question test of homophobia. Are you okay? with hanging out with gay men or not. I don't know if much more needs to be said about that question. Looking at question 11, it says, it's embarrassing for a guy to ask for help. This is another one of those questions that comes down to expressing feelings and how masculine it is to ask for help as opposed to just keeping it inside. And perhaps, to some extent, it's true, it is embarrassing for a man to ask for help. Many men will feel that way. Uh, at the same time, if you don't ask for help, you will never get what you want. And it is another thing that can be associated with poor mental health outcomes down the line. Is this the kind of masculinity that we should be trying to cultivate, one where men can't express their feelings or ask for help? Yes or no? Perhaps there's some debate on that. I think many people would say no. Going on, we're going to look at the last question now. Looking at the last question, I think it's important for a guy to be able to express his feelings even if people might laugh at him. Reverse coded, so meaning the opposite. Men should not express their feelings because people might laugh. Again, we've covered enough questions in this 12 series of questions that are basically asking a similar thing. And that is that, should men be able to express their feelings or not? Let me know what you guys think in the comments about that. If this is a positive masculine expectation or a positive masculine role, don't express your feelings or not. So now, we've looked at this masculine norm adherence, we've looked at the scale, the adolescent masculinity ideology and relationships scale. The other big variable that we're looking at here is pro-social behavior, because remember, these questions, this scale, negatively predicted pro-social behavior in adolescence. So when we look at pro-social behavior, again, we have to look at the psychometric device, the questions, the test being administered. What is pro-social behavior to these researchers? What are they measuring? And in this case, what we're looking at is a pro-social behavior scale. And here are the items in that scale. Item number one, or question number one, and this is applied to boys as far as their interactions with other boys. So when it says, I think that girls boys, just read it as I think that boys, because it's being applied two boys as far as their interactions with other young boys. But, question number one, I think that boys should provide physical assistance, for example, when someone falls down. Now I wonder, does anyone disagree with that? Would you say that this is a unmasculine behavior? I think most people would say that this is a traditionally masculine and pro-social behavior. Strong person helping a weak person, a strong boy helping his friend who has fallen down, who is presumably weaker or at least has fallen for whatever reason. He's weaker at that very moment. So strong person helping his comrade in that moment. Item number two, I think that boys should be willing to hang out. For example, going to a friend's house when you don't really want to. So here we're looking at a question that is examining sociability really, not necessarily pro-social behavior, perhaps as, as a proxy, but not directly. Should you go hang out at other people's houses when you don't want to? I mean, sounds pretty ambiguous to me. I'm not gonna tell you that this is uh, by itself a strong indicator of pro-social behavior or not, or, or that it's masculine or that it's not. I would think perhaps it's even better to be able to say no if you don't really want to do something. That that might be the more masculine option, but to give you an example, this is what is being measured as pro-social behavior. Item number three. I think that boys should stand up for others, for example, when someone is making fun of someone else in the class. And what we're looking at here is basically saying, again, masculine behavior, standing up against bullies, and pro-social behavior. I think this is the kind of masculinity that many fathers would like to teach 
and idealized in their sons at that age, 11 to 13. Item number four. I think that boys should comfort their friends, for example, when they are upset. So is this a specifically masculine behavior? Probably not. It's probably something maybe that you would see even better in women being able to comfort their friends. But it is a pro-social behavior, and it isn't an anti-masculine behavior. It shows strong social competence, so it's not a surprise that pro-social behavior in this scale also predicted social competence for these boys. Item number five. I think that boys should coach others in social skills. So, pro-social behavior, helping others become more socially aware. And I think if you found this channel and you like channels similar to this and topics similar to this, you're probably a guy that's into some kind of coaching for social skills. You probably might want to improve your own social skills or your own dating abilities and chances. You might be into male self-improvement, whatever. That whole world there, that whole theme is basically coaching others in social skills or being coached in your social skills. Item six, I think that boys should do something for the community. And I think that this question here is probably the closest measure, the closest item in this measure of what pro-social high status male behavior looks like in the wild, in human prehistory, in hunter-gatherers, in early human civilization, and in modern humans. The most dominant men, the men highest in the social dominance hierarchy, are the men who are able to provide something of value to the community. These would have been men who perhaps were physically strong, able to protect the tribe, who can hunt well and collect resources and provide for the tribe. Maybe they can build. Maybe they have talents to construct things that help everyone in the group. And on an interpersonal level, in relationships, these are men who take care of their wives, they take care of their girlfriends. Even the people they're dating casually, they make sure that they have a good time and that they take care of those people. They're people that others rely on and they come to for help. The psychologist David Buss described these people as coalition builders. Basically, the alphas are the ones that can build coalitions of other men, of other tribesmen who are also high in status around them. The last item, I think that boys should be inclusive for example, letting people join in even when they're not necessarily liked that much. Well, there's a lot of political rhetoric at the moment around inclusiveness and what that means. This question seems less specific than some of the others. And if boys should be more inclusive or less inclusive may depend on what you are looking at and how you feel about that topic. But in general, at least for me, Leaning toward inclusiveness, getting all the boys on the playground to play together, not hanging out with a small, isolated clique of boys, but getting everyone to play baseball, basketball together, or whatever, is probably going to be the better option there. So up to this point, we've looked at our two measures. We've looked at masculine roles, and we've looked at pro-social behavior. If you reflect back on the results that we looked at at the beginning, those masculine roles, they negatively predict pro-social behavior. And that pro-social behavior negatively predicts social competence in those boys. So what we're seeing is an indirect relationship between boys who try very, very hard to fulfill these masculine roles and boys who are lower in that social dominance hierarchy. The social dominance hierarchy on the playground, because these are, of course, young, young boys here, 11 to 13 years old. Now, if we ask ourselves why this may be, there are a couple of points from past research which is mentioned in the introduction that may help us understand why this may be the case. First, we should look at what is called the gender intensification hypothesis. When young boys begin to reach puberty, when they begin to reach the point where they become little men, they begin to emulate masculine roles because they're not masculine, they're, they're boys, they're children but they're learning, they're trying to learn, they're trying to learn to be men, and so they see what men do, or at least what the child's mind thinks a man is like, and they emulate those in a very stereotypical way. So they see men, for example, on TV fighting, so they're getting in fights with their friends on the playground. It is a very ham-fisted kind of emulation of actual men by children. Additionally, and I'll put up 
Another quotation from the introduction here. This is a behavior that we see, particularly in prepubescent boys, right before they begin to reach puberty. When the boys are a little bit older, as teens, as early teens, they swap. They say, ah, masculine roles are now less important, now we're going to focus on that pro-social behavior. So what this tells us is that this tendency, this need to really emulate these masculine roles in a very stereotypical and negative way, is basically a very childish behavior. It is what the youngest boys do because they don't know any better. They're trying to figure it out, they're trying to be men, and they're ham-fistedly copying what they see out there. As soon as they begin to hit puberty, as soon as they get actual testosterone in their bodies, which many people think of as an aggression hormone, and indeed it has individual effects on aggression, but it's also a hormone that acts as a neurotransmitter, and it has very, very important effects for pro-social behavior in groups, and especially for pair bonding and pro-social behavior in romantic relationships. So as soon as these boys begin to hit puberty, as soon as they begin to get that testosterone pumping through their bodies, it flips a switch and they say, ah, okay, I've done the masculine thing, I've kind of figured that out, and now I need to learn about pro-social behavior. I need to learn to build coalitions. I need to learn to ascend in the social hierarchy of, I guess it would be the high school at this age. To some extent, this reminds me of Kohlberg's moral development theories and also of Erickson's developmental theories. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Boys and girls, they go through stages at different periods of life where they have to develop morally or they have to develop a social role. And if they miss that, if they miss those social roles, boom. They don't get a second opportunity and it's kind of stunted there. So what we see in men who remain very low in social dominance, who remain very low in pro-social behavior as they begin to get older and older, is they tend to remain very childlike. I want to say uh, a man-child, I think, is the way that some people would describe them. They never learn pro-social behavior and they never learn to create things in the world around them. They remain in that mindset like our young 12 to 13 year old boys who are still trying very, very hard to cultivate a masculine image without having ever become truly internalized men in their own right. Somewhere in that transition from 12 to 13 to 14 to 15, they didn't make it and it's affected their lives in a very negative way. And these are the men who will, in the long term, become criminals. They will go to jail, they'll remain very low in status, and they will have, unfortunately, a very, very bleak future. The boys that learn to emulate the masculine roles up to a point, and then they learn to behave in constructive, pro-social ways, are the ones that are going to have the best future. And we see this when we look at measures of pro-sociality in adults. It's one of the best predictors of relationship success. It's one of the best predictors of career success, of having many friends when you grow up, of being able to get good grades in school. The list goes on and on and on, and I would like to cover this topic at a later point. It definitely deserves its own time. But I think this is the take home message from this study. For many of you watching this who are young men, you might be teenagers, you might be 18, you might be in your mid 20s and you might not know where to go and you might be seeing very negative masculine roles in the world around you and thinking ah i see men emulating these negative roles they seem to be masculine i would advise against emulating the masculine roles that are destructive and negative and instead trying to emulate those that are pro-social and that's going to consist of a lot of building up your own skills and abilities there's no shortcut there's not an easy way to do it which is another thing that happens with people who try to emulate violent or destructive masculine norms. A lot of the time those are things that happen very quickly and very easily, like getting in a fight. It's much, much easier to get into a fight than it is to graduate from school, guys. It's much, much easier to get into a fight and beat someone up than it is to learn a trade or to build a cabinet. So, just some examples and some things I want you all to think about. Because I would really like to encourage true masculinity, true leadership. 
which is going to be very, very intertwined with pro-social behavior. Anyway, I hope you guys liked this video. I hope you learned something. If you did, if you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, follow the channel, and I will talk to you guys later.